Hello, youngsters. If this is your second or third time watching one of my videos and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for your boy. Prepare to immerse yourself in this captivating recap story video. Jin Yuk loomed menacingly, casting a baleful gaze upon Uriel. With a resounding stomp that sent tremors through the floor and a foreboding aura enveloping him, Jin Hyuk warned her to choose her words wisely. Uriel then inquired if he knows about the consequences of reaching the 999th floor of the tower. Still wearing an enraged expression, Jin Hyuk responded, suggesting that one might become a voyeuristic transcendent, akin to a deity or demon, overseeing the tower's affairs. Uriel referred to these beings as the angels, but she paused and amended her statement. Noting that the four royalties had been consumed by their arrogance, attempting to monopolize their positions and eliminating those who sought to conquer the tower, except themselves. In bewilderment, Jin Hyuk mumbled, Select and kill. Uriel asked if he knew about it. Jin Hyuk, now convinced that the mastermind was before him, furiously threatened to deliver her head to where his wings resided. He seized her by the neck with shadowy hands, prompting her to explain that she became wingless a decade ago for opposing the select and kill order on a particular climber, whose name was Death Star Cha Jin Hyuk. Upon hearing this revelation, Jin Hyuk released his grip, awkwardly acknowledging his improper behavior and offering an apology. Uriel assured him that it was all right and accepted the burden of her actions. Jin Hyuk, understanding the distinction between the wingless and the angels, refrained from venting his anger on her. Uriel expressed her gratitude for his understanding and suggested that, like them, there might be other victims of the Four Royalties, encouraging Jin Hyuk to welcome them if they approached. Jin Hyuk agreed, realizing their potential allies in the war against the Four Royalties. He then inquired about where to meet her again, and she directed him to the wingless hideout on the 190th floor of Dream City. Jin Hyuk remarked that the 190th floor seemed significantly lower than he had expected. Uriel explained that the higher the floor, the more influence the four royalties held, and the floors from 200 to 300 were under his territory. Jin Hyuk realized that he had almost forgotten that this territory was under the reign of the Martial Emperor Tess, who ruled over the floors from 200 to 300. Setting up their base within his territory meant a higher chance of the four royalties meeting their destruction. When Uriel asked if she could get dressed, Jin Yuk agreed, saying, of course. As she prepared to put on her coat, he couldn't help but notice her feathers. He inquired if there would be a trace if she gave him something, and she explained that due to the pursuit of the angels, she could only bring herself. With a creepy grin, Jin Yuk assured her that it was enough. Uriel, however, looked at him with disdain, asking, You were that type of person? Panicking, Jin Yuk clarified that he didn't mean that and only wanted some of her feathers. Uriel sighed with relief and mentioned that if it's that, she can give him some, because her feathers grow back as she removed some for him. Jin Yuk inwardly acknowledged his relief, thinking he'd asked carefully because he believed they didn't grow back. After giving him some of her feathers, she cautioned him not to show the feathers outside, as angels had a skill for locating the feather's owner. Jin Hyuk assured her he planned to consume them. Her mood shifted, and she teased, so you were that type of person. Jin Hyuk insisted he wasn't that type, and she trusted him, telling him to get going and that she'd see him next time in Dream City. Jin Hyuk agreed, promising to meet her expectations. She said she'd look forward to it, and then disappeared. Jin Yuk sat down, and Vulcan asked if he was going to eat the wing now. Jin Yuk, filled with excitement, confirmed this, and wondered if he could endure the angel's divine power and what abilities he might gain. Vulcan, resigned since the third poison, told him to do as he pleased. He then told Miho to not eat anything she found, much like Jin Yuk. Jin Yuk proceeded to eat the wing, but something unexpected happened. His entire body began to emanate a golden aura as he screamed in pain. Vulcan, accustomed to these bizarre situations, simply shrugged 
and went on to give Miho an airplane ride while Jinyuk struggled to breathe. Jinyuk's screams of pain echoed in the background, but Vulcan paid little attention. Suddenly, Jinhyuk found himself waking up in the mind realm. Confused, he asked himself if he had fainted, realizing that he was now in this unusual place. He contemplated whether his body had decided that consuming divine power was too much, meaning he had to win here. As he got to his feet, Jinyuk turned around and was met with the sight of an enormous glistening golden waterfall. That waterfall embodied the divine power surging within him, resembling a colossal mountain. Jinyuk silently expressed relief that he didn't have to engage in a battle with Uriel. Even if he had emerged victorious and devoured her essence, the thought was too unsettling to dwell upon. Suddenly the water began to surge, and it dawned on him that the waterfall was more than just a mere illusion. He needed to break through this cascade of divine power before it seized control of his mental realm. He pondered his options and with a sly grin he mused, well, there's only one way, isn't there? Back in the tangible world, Vulcan's attention shifted to Jin Hyuk, observing that he was employing spirit power, but there was something distinct this time. Jin Yuk was utilizing his own soul as the substance for this spirit power. Miho appeared concerned, yet Vulcan reassured her, expressing faith in Jin Yuk because his actions indicated he had a plan. Vulcan eagerly anticipated what surprises Jin Hyuk had in store. Returning to Jin Hyuk's struggle, he was witness sucking the divine power through a conduit. After a few moments, he admitted, This isn't it either. To encapsulate his spirit power imbued with divine essence, he reasoned that crafting an image of himself consuming it, given that he had acquired the power through gluttony, would be the right approach. However, he felt that failure was looming if he continued down this path. If the divine power overwhelmed him, he'd either lose consciousness permanently or have to relinquish this newfound power. Nonetheless, with unwavering determination, he questioned himself calming his nerves by acknowledging that it was a creation of his own soul. Suddenly a shadowy figure began to materialize, and a massive shadowy monster materialized beside Jin Hyuk. Sporting a devious grin, Jin Hyuk declared, now this is the real deal. He proceeded to manipulate the monstrous entity which began to consume the golden divine power bit by bit. Jin Hyuk maintained his menacing smirk, repeatedly chanting, more, more, more as his shadowy creation voraciously devoured the divine power. Back in the real world, Jin Hyuk was seen smirking, and near him, Baal wore a satisfied smile. Bale began to clap with excitement, noting that Jin Hyuk's actions seemed to mirror his own. He welcomed the emergence of the demon king of gluttony. In a brief flashback, Jin Hyuk had mentioned the greedy dragon, and the gold rich had identified this entity as Baal. To them, Bale was a neutral deity with a penchant for scheming. True to his name, he possessed an insatiable greed, indulging in various species and desiring even more. He's an insatiable dragon with an appetite for everything in this world, aptly named the Greedy Dragon. Goldrich had just started explaining the enigmatic history of this Greedy Dragon, when the flashback abruptly ceased, bringing us back to the present, where Jin Hyuk harnessed his greed and completely consumed the divine power. In the tangible world, Vulcan roused Jin Hyuk from his trance, and Miho, elated to see him awake, eagerly embraced him with a hug. Jin Hyuk assured her he was back. Vulcan couldn't resist asking if Jin Hyuk had succeeded or failed, ready to poke fun if it were the latter. With a smirk, Jin Hyuk dismissed Vulcan's hopes of mockery affirming his success as he exhibited his newfound divine energy merged with the dark power. Jin Yuk explained that despite its current small size, he had developed an organ capable of generating divine power. He turned to Vulcan for his opinion, asking if he was content with this result. Vulcan privately marveled at the extraordinary outcome, but also recognized the lurking danger. Jin Yuk not yet strong enough to withstand a coordinated assault from the four royalties, was vulnerable. In his current incomplete state, facing off against the four royalties could prove fatal. A few days later, on the 10th floor hunting ground, 
Jin Yuk's spirit soldiers were busy dispatching numerous orcs. Suddenly, they encountered an unusual looking orc that managed to take down one of the spirits. Jin Hyuk and Vulcan watched from above, and Jin Yuk uttered, It has begun, with a growing pile of orc corpses behind him. The orc skillfully cleaved through the spirit soldiers, leaving them bisected on the ground. A sudden radiant glow emanated from the wounds, leaving the orc in awe. The source of the golden light was a celestial spirit soldier. Jin Hyuk turned to Vulcan and inquired about his experience with the new Holy Spirit soldier. Vulcan shared that it performed as expected, serving as the exclusive healer for both the undead and spirit soldiers. It completely nullified the typical necromancer's drawback of resource wastage due to weak endurance during summoning. Nevertheless, given its divine nature, it had a propensity for seeking enlightenment. Jin Hyuk commented on the situation, noting that they could only be cautious in dealing with it. Meanwhile, Miho indulged in consuming the orcs. Vulcan remarked that it seemed like she had finished her meal. Jin Hyuk inquired whether it was enjoyable. Observing the quest notification displaying that Miho had devoured 892 raw livers out of 999, Jin Hyuk contemplated how he had unexpectedly earned the Orc Slayer title for the second time. He then opened his status window, revealing his traits, stats, name, skills, subclass, class and physical condition. Inwardly, he acknowledged that his divine power had grown over the past few days, increasing by two, although with a base value of three, it might not be exceptionally helpful. However, he could resort to it in emergencies. Vulcan asked Jin Hyuk what they should do next. Jin Hyuk responded that they should proceed to meet Hendrik. Upon returning to the city, Jin Hyuk inquired with Vulcan about the accuracy of the information. Vulcan affirmed that Hendrik was indeed not ascending the tower, seemingly waiting for someone. Inwardly, Jin Hyuk deduced that Hendrik, a dragon slayer inhabiting a dragon's body, piqued his interest. If Hendrik remained stuck on the 10th floor, there had to be a significant reason. Just like Uriel, Hendrik might be anticipating something after listening a revelation from the gods and demons. Vulcan informed Jin Hyuk that they had arrived, and once they left the alley they would encounter Hendrik. Jin Hyuk stepped out of the alley and found himself surrounded by a multitude of people. Upon closer inspection, he spotted a man with horns and red eyes, enveloped in a crimson aura. Considering their approach, Jin Hyuk asked Vulcan if they should approach Hendrik directly. Vulcan, cautious of the situation, inquired whether Jin Hyuk was willing to engage with Hendrik, as he might not be the person Hendrik was expecting, potentially leading to a deadly confrontation. Jin Hyuk, sporting a mischievous grin, proposed settling the matter through combat. Vulcan responded, dubbing Jin Hyuk insane and suggesting that he go on ahead without him. Jin Yuk taunted Vulcan, stating that he knew Vulcan was fearful due to a past encounter where he got quite battered in a fight with Hendrik. Vulcan retorted, Scared? Who got battered? Defending his pride as the first spirit master, Vulcan asserted he'd never run away. Jin Hyuk, however, urged him not to lie, mentioning how he had fled, looking worse for wear. Hendrik suddenly closed his eyes, and they were transported into a flashback where he was told that the one who could fulfill his wish would appear on the 10th floor and ask to wait. Returning to the present, Vulcan and Jin Hyuk faced Hendrik. Jin Hyuk asked if he was Hendrik, to which Hendrik replied in the affirmative, adding that he had been wondering when Jin Hyuk would approach him. Hendrik then recognized Vulcan as a familiar face, causing Vulcan to tremble. Hendrik abruptly declared that Jin Hyuk had passed, prompting Jin Hyuk to express his displeasure with Hendrik's initial judgment, though he chose to let it slide, since Hendrik said that he passed. Hendrik noted the prying eyes around them, and requested that Jin Hyuk follow him. They reached what seemed like a dead-end alley, leaving Jin Hyuk puzzled about why they had ventured so far. Jin Hyuk pointed out the many alleys in the square. Suddenly, Hendrik placed his hand on the wall, and a portal materialized. He entered it, and Jin Yuk informed Vulcan that they would follow Hendrik, stepping through the portal. 
Inside, Jin Hyuk questioned Hendrik about their location, to which Hendrik explained it was a subspace, a hidden space on the tenth floor where the eyes of the gods and demons held no power. Jin Hyuk contemplated that he could unmistakably sense that something had weakened. Hendrik posed a question, expressing his intention to exterminate all the dragons who had slain him within the tower. He asked Jin Yuk if he was prepared to join him in achieving this goal. Jin Yuk responded with a smirk, remarking that Hendrik's ambition seemed rather petty for a man of his stature. Incensed, Hendrik demanded clarification about what Jin Yuk meant by petty. Vulcan intervened, privately informing Jin Hyuk that Hendrik was a formidable monster on a different level and questioned why he was provoking him. Jin Hyuk telepathically labelled Vulcan a loser and assured him that he had a plan in mind. Addressing Hendrik, Jin Hyuk acknowledged that he might not fully understand Hendrik's situation, but he could grasp how Hendrik had become the way he was. Jin Hyuk expressed his certainty that Hendrik was aware that the culprits who had wronged them weren't limited to the four royalties. Jin Hyuk stated that he didn't care why Hendrik had become fixated on dragons, but declared it insufficient for him to form an alliance. He proclaimed his intention to exact vengeance on all those who had wronged him, irrespective of whether they were the four royalties or anyone else. In essence, Hendrik's goals was too little for Jin Hyuk to ally with him. Hendrik, in response, inquired if Jin Hyuk genuinely planned to confront the four royalties. Congratulations on reaching this point. If you've managed to make it this far, please leave a comment saying Necromancer to confuse those who skipped this section or failed to watch the entire video. Jin Hyuk asserts that they both embody a state of death yet alive, attributing those malevolent individuals as the culprits responsible for his demise. Abruptly, Hendrik begins to chuckle eventually erupting into laughter, leaving Jin Hyuk and Vulcan to observe him in silence. Subsequently, Hendrik extends his apologies, affirming Jin Hyuk's correctness. A sudden transformation in Hendrik's demeanor transpires, marked by an earnest expression as he proclaims Jin Hyuk as the prophesied individual spoken of by Uriel. This declaration leaves Jin Hyuk startled, concealing his internal wonderment concerning whether wingless beings have already approached Hendrik. Hendrik proceeds to unsheathe his sword while expressing his anticipation for an impending confrontation. He articulates his intent to personally assess and scrutinize Jin Yuk's commitment, questioning whether it is genuine or a mere charade, dubbing Jin Yuk as the one who conspires against the divine will. Subsequently, Hendrik inquires about Jin Yuk's identity. In response, Jin Hyuk unveils his countenance by removing his mask, introducing himself as Cha Jin Yuk, bearing the epithet, the Death Star. Suddenly an elderly gentleman exclaims, labeling Hendrik as a troublesome figure for revisiting this place. He questions whether Hendrik has yet to accomplish his initial purpose. Jin Yuk, perplexed, inquires about the identity of the elderly man. Hendrik reveals him as the local blacksmith and the creator of his sword. The blacksmith confirms his role, and chastises Hendrik for his return, given that he has already acquired the sword. He inquires about the reason for Hendrik's reappearance. Upon a closer examination, Jin Hyuk discerns the old men as an oni. The oni observes the peculiar amalgamation of a spirit and a mythical being following under a human, and inquires about Jin Hyuk's identity. Jin Hyuk inquired of the elderly gentleman how he had managed to survive to which the old man, somewhat displeased, branded Jin Yuk as a disrespectful scoundrel lacking reverence for his elders. He brusquely challenged Jin Hyuk to air any grievances he might have. Jin Hyuk clarified his intent, seeking to know how the old man had endured that calamity. Suddenly the Oni's countenance shifted to one of gravity, and he poised himself to strike Jin Hyuk with his mallet convinced that Jin Hyuk was the arsonist responsible for his village's devastation. However, Hendrik intervened, restraining the Oni's hand. The Oni, tears glistening in his eyes, implored Hendrik to release him, asserting that Jin Hyuk had set his village ablaze. Hendrik reassured him, urging him to calm down and explaining that Jin Hyuk shared a similar background. Vulcan, curious, 
inquired if the Oni was acquainted with an Oni named Haryu. The Oni, taken aback, questioned how Vulcan knew Haryu. Back at the elderly man's location, Jin Hyuk quietly recounted his encounter with Haryu, prompting a sense of relief in the Oni upon hearing that Haryu was alive. Hendrik, standing nearby, pondered internally how surprising it was that such a fortuitous coincidence had unfolded. The Oni recounted that that day marked the commencement of their village's traditional festival. Every Oni had ascended to the 100th floor, but due to his advanced age and illness, he had stayed behind. Tragically, that very night, his village was reduced to ashes. Anxiously, the Oni inquired about Haryu's safety. Jin Hyuk reassured him, disclosing that Haryu was currently on the ninth floor, and they would soon reunite with her. The Oni then noticed the mask in Jin Hyuk's possession and inquired if it belonged to Haryu. Jin Hyuk confirmed it, explaining that Haryu had regarded it as her way of repaying him for saving her. Hendrik, curious about Haryu's strength, asked Jin Hyuk, who affirmed her prowess, and added that she was still growing likely surpassing them in one-on-one -on -one battles. Hendrik inquired about Haryu's status in Jin Hyuk's party, wondering if she was a temporary or permanent member. Jin Hyuk explained that he had embraced Haryu's mask and committed to seeking vengeance alongside her. Geno, the only blacksmith, gratefully grasped Jin Hyuk's hand and introduced himself. He pledged to do everything within his power to support Jin Hyuk, and implored them to rebuild the village with Haryu. Jin Hyuk, slightly taken aback, responded, Pardon? Ah, well, we should. Observing the scene, Vulcan mused internally about whether Jin Hyuk comprehended that accepting the mask was equivalent to accepting Haryu's proposal. Geno generously offered all the weapons in his workshop. After inspecting the swords, Jin Hyuk noted their exceptional quality, surpassing those received from Gold Rich. Hendrik clarified that Geno was the finest Oni blacksmith, explaining the exceptional craftsmanship. Following this exchange, they decided to depart, but found Geno peacefully asleep. Hendrik remarked that Geno appeared to have finally relaxed upon learning of a survivor from his village, a rarity in his experience. Jinyuk suggested they leave Geno to rest, and expressed his intention to bring Haryu to meet him. As he observed the elderly man, Jin Hyuk inwardly anticipated that Haryu would gain strength from this meeting and felt pleased. Suddenly Vulcan urgently called Jin Hyuk and warned him to be cautious. With swift reflexes, Jin Hyuk evaded an attack from Hendrik. In response, he questioned Hendrik's motives. Hendrik reminded him about their previous discussion, emphasizing that he had mentioned testing Jin Hyuk. Grinning, he warned that if Jin Hyuk wasn't skilled enough to survive, he should abandon any notion of challenging the will of the gods. Jin Hyuk retorted, insisting that he would test Hendrik as well. Just as their conversation unfolded, nearby buildings began to crumble, marking the onset of a fierce battle between Jin Hyuk and Hendrik. As Jin Hyuk dispatched his spectral warriors toward Hendrik, the latter swiftly drew his blade and cleaved those ethereal entities into countless fragments. Out of thin air, floating blades converged around Hendrik, poised to pierce him. But he thwarted their attempt by swinging his sword, recognizing it as shallow tricks. Unexpectedly, Jin Hyuk materialized above Hendrik and launched an offensive with his blade, yet Hendrik adeptly evaded the strike. With a deft maneuver, Hendrik gripped Jin Hyuk's hand and flung him onto a nearby house, leaving Miho anxious. Hendrik acknowledged Jin Hyuk's title as a mage and necromancer, acknowledging his remarkable dexterity, but cautioned that this trait could lead to a problem. Suddenly, Vulcan materialized behind Hendrik and ensnared him with his chains, questioning him about what he thinks about the first spirit master. Jin Hyuk then unleashed a potent magic technique called Gungnir, astonishing Hendrik as he claimed it to be his mightiest. Grinning, Jin Hyuk exclaimed, Chaya! and launched arrows toward Hendrik. In response, Hendrik's sword reacted, forming intricate patterns which Vulcan recognized. Hendrik employed a skill known as Enchant Dispel Magic, severing the chains that bound him. Seeing this, 
Vulcan urgently instructed Jin Yuk to dodge. Hendrik unleashed another skill, shattering Dragon Slash, intercepting and obliterating the arrow before advancing toward Jin Yuk. The ensuing impact caused a massive explosion. Vulcan, with concern in his voice, called out to Jin Hyuk. Hendrik struck Vulcan with his sword, noting that Vulcan was Jin Hyuk's most potent soldier, leaving him with nothing more to say as he closed in on Jin Hyuk, proclaiming his impending defeat. Jin Hyuk then appeared on the side of the house, calmly stating, Nope. Holding a bow, he declared himself as the strongest one remaining. Jin Hyuk aimed and shot a volley of small arrows toward Hendrik, but he completely missed him prompting a retort from Hendrik about the stark contrast between Jin Hyuk's swordsmanship and his archery skills, describing the latter as atrocious. However, the arrows took an unexpected turn, glowing with magic, and returned to pierce Hendrik, causing him to descend. Inwardly, Jin Hyuk celebrated a critical hit and resolved to go all out to finish Hendrik, donning his Oni mask. He mentioned that he had only previously brought out the side effects when using the mask with Haryu, but now he intended to succeed. As he put on the mask, he harnessed his battle foresight. Falling, Hendrik's anger intensified, conjuring a colossal fire tornado at his location. Jin Hyuk regretfully noted that he had missed his chance and that Hendrik was not an easy foe to vanquish. Hendrik now with a transformed countenance, laughed and acknowledged Jin Hyuk's strength, asserting that he had lost in terms of numbers. He declared that the fight wasn't over, craving more. Hendrik unleashed his skill, charging Dragon Spark, urging Jin Hyuk to continue the battle. Jin Hyuk was left in disbelief, internally grappling with the realization that there seemed to be no way out. He could track Hendrik's attacks with his battle foresight, but he lacked the speed to evade them, and getting hit would prove fatal. With no alternative, Jin Hyuk retrieved his fox mask, donning it and expressing his trust in it. He looked rather impressive with his new mask. The elderly man's eyes snapped open, his shock palpable as he beheld the havoc wrought by Jin Hyuk and Hendrik. He bellowed, demanding to know what was happening, suspecting Hendrik's hand in it. In an instant, Miho sprang from her slumber and fled the house leaving Garon in pursuit, shouting to her about the danger. As Miho gazed at a colossal beam of light, her apprehension was etched across her face. The source of the radiance was none other than Hendrik, as he readied an attack known as the Charging Dragon Spark. He abruptly vanished, leaving Jin Hyuk bewildered by his sudden disappearance. Out of nowhere, Hendrik reappeared before Jin Hyuk, his sword perilously close to his face. A colossal explosion ensued, and when the dust cleared, it was evident that Jin Hyuk had evaded Hendrik's assault. After the debris cleared, Hendrik was astounded to realize that Jin Hyuk had miraculously evaded his devastating attack, causing him to secretly concede that this wasn't an assault that Jin Hyuk's agility alone could evade. With a serene poise, Jin Hyuk materialized behind Hendrik, untouched by the confrontation. This left Hendrik pondering whether the enigmatic mask adorning Jin Hyuk belonged to that mystical fox. Hendrik couldn't help but chuckle, questioning Jin Hyuk's motives as he prepared to retaliate. Jin Hyuk, however, equipped weapons similar to Wolverine's and lunged at Hendrik, their blades clashing in a tense showdown. Countless clashes ensued between them, their weapons clashing and sparking in a flurry of combat. Abruptly, Hendrik burst into laughter, complimenting Jin Yuk's enhanced mobility and newfound strength. Pondering aloud whether the mystical fox mask was the source of this transformation. In response, Jin Yuk maintained an unwavering silence, his eyes carefully scanning for an opportunity. Seizing a perceived weakness, he lunged forward to strike, but soon realized that Hendrik had deliberately created this opening to deploy his magic. Hendrik's sorcery triggered a powerful explosion where Jin Yuk had stood moments ago. Astonishingly, Jin Yuk emerged from the settling dust unscathed, poised in a defensive stance. With an intense gaze, he attempted to employ the charm skill on Hendrik. However, Hendrik swiftly shattered the charm and quipped, I don't swing that way. A chuckle followed, with Hendrik explaining that such spells could be easily broken with a bit of focus. Suddenly, 
Jin Hyuk materialized in front of Hendrik, retorting, but you'd have to stop moving for a moment. Internally, Jin Hyuk resolved not to employ a weak weapon and decided to conclude the confrontation with a decisive attack. He announced his intention to employ the Gyung Hoon skill, combining it with all Master Martial Combat, Fox's mobility, and various enchantments, such as enhanced physical strength, spirit power, demonic energy, and divine power. As he readied a punch, he informed Hendrik that this would be the end, concluding with a taunting remark and unleashing the Choi Gyung Hoon technique, the straight jab. With a mighty shove, Jin Yuk propelled Hendrik, unleashing a cataclysmic explosion that laid waste to numerous buildings. Amid the debris, Vulcan struggled to regain his footing, questioning whether he had lost consciousness and pondering the outcome of the battle between Jin Yuk and Hendrik. His attention was abruptly drawn to Cha Jin Yuk, standing as if he had emerged victorious. Blood trickled from Jin Yuk's eyes and mouth as he began to stagger, prompting Vulcan to call out his name with deep concern. Internally, Jin Yuk acknowledged that he had expended all his strength, rendering his body immobile. He regretted not finishing Hendrik with his last attack, especially since Hendrik remained standing before him far from defeated. Hendrik, visibly battered and fatigued, informed Jin Yuk that he had passed. However, Jin Yuk's irritation flared, and he rebuked Hendrik, asserting that he had failed. He emphasized that deploying a final move should render one incapacitated, all while dubbing Hendrik a monster. Hendrik, seemingly perturbed, raised a contemplative finger to his chin, expressing annoyance while saying, to think that Jin Hyuk would fail him while looking like that. Abruptly, Hendrik relented with a begrudging fine, announcing his intent to determine Jin Hyuk's fate after unleashing his ultimate assault. He reasoned that he had taken a liking to Jin Hyuk, so he needed to pass no matter what. Jin Hyuk, however, implored him to hold off, as his body refused to respond, yet Hendrik remained undeterred, preparing to execute his flower dragon attack. As the formidable assault closed in on Jin Yuk, he acquiesced with a resigned fine you pass, and in his last breath he hurled an expletive at Hendrik, branding him a fucking bastard, just as the attack made its devastating impact. The scene shifts to a comical exchange between Jin Hyuk and Vulcan inside the elderly gentleman's abode. Vulcan teased Jin Hyuk for his loss, but Jin Hyuk retorted, claiming that Vulcan had lost as well. Vulcan reminded Jin Hyuk of the promise he made to Hendrik about testing him. Jin Hyuk, wrapped in bandages, grew increasingly irritated with Vulcan and threatened to turn him into a spirit orb. However, his attempt was met with excruciating pain, causing him to halt, and Vulcan couldn't help but giggle, remarking, Serves you right. Sporting a broad grin, Vulcan pointed out that he had cautioned Jin Hyuk not to go overboard emphasizing that Jin Hyuk owed his continued existence to meeting Uriel and attaining divine power. Jin Hyuk playfully referred to Vulcan as an old man, further infuriating him. Jin Hyuk, clearly irked, challenged Vulcan to wait and see what would happen once he recovered, all while Vulcan continues to chuckle and dismiss Jin Hyuk's frustration as the cries of a loser. Suddenly Hendrik swung open the door and entered the room, inquiring about Jin Hyuk's well-being. Vulcan began to sweat profusely, recalling Hendrik's previous threat to slice him to pieces. Awkwardly, Vulcan offered an apology for his earlier actions. Hendrik responded with a smirk, reassuring Vulcan that it was all right since they were all in the same boat now. Vulcan, visibly relieved, stammered out his gratitude and inwardly noted the stark contrast between Hendrik's demeanour in a fight against Jinyuk and his normal composed self. Vulcan then expressed remorse for the trouble Hendrik had gone through to check on Jin Hyuk. Hendrik inquired if he had gone a little overboard. Jin Hyuk, still reeling from being Lil Broad, exploded, challenging both of them to face him in a fight, convinced he'd win next time. Inwardly, Hendrik acknowledged that Jin Hyuk would indeed be capable of defeating him one day. After taking a deep breath, Jin Hyuk calmed down and revealed the reason he had summoned Hendrik. He wanted to hear Hendrik's story, particularly about his past life and death. 
Hendrik began by recounting how his family and hometown had vanished mysteriously, courtesy of the dragons. His miraculous survival was attributed to his burning hatred for dragons. He proceeded to climb the tower just like other climbers, but he was fortunate to possess exceptional talent. Jin Hyuk noted the similarity between Hendrik's history and that of someone else he knew. Hendrik divulged that he had slain his first dragon on the 600th floor and subsequently embarked on a journey of revenge. Jin Hyuk remarked on the quick progress to the 600th floor, wondering if Hendrik then went on to confront the four royalties. Hendrik confirmed this, but mentioned that it also marked the commencement of a pursuit by a team dispatched by the four royalties. This pursuit became his daily routine, and as he grew stronger, the penalty lessened. He revealed that their branch on the 800th floor had essentially been wiped out. Inwardly, Jinyuk explained that the penalty system was designed to prevent high-level climbers from monopolizing the tower, imposing restrictions on their abilities on lower floors, rather than the higher ones they'd reached. This was why he'd survived Goldrich's attack. If there wasn't a penalty, he would have died from one attack. He asked Hendrik about the highest floor he'd reached, and Hendrik replied, 900th floor. It was on that floor that his plan ultimately met its demise. Jinhyuk realized that Hendrik could have become a transcendent. Hendrik continued his tale, explaining that a more formidable pursuit team under the four royalties had been dispatched to capture him, and he eventually succumbed to their numbers. He became like this, he said. Hendrik found it ironic that among the myriad species he had reincarnated into the body of a dragon. He desired death but couldn't easily achieve it in such a powerful form, so he accepted it, vowing to use this body as a tool for his revenge. Jin Yuk replied with a smirk, Yeah, that sounds like you. Hendrik, eager to get started, asked when they should begin climbing. However, he suddenly recalled that Jin Hyuk had mentioned waiting for Haru. Jin Hyuk, looking puzzled, inquired whether Hendrik intended to join them in climbing the tower. With a playful grin, Hendrik quipped, Where would I go after leaving you, weakling? Making Jin Hyuk more pissed off. Hendrik then asserted that he and Jin Hyuk were remarkably similar, because they both had faced their last moments alone in their previous lives, marred by failure. They needed to learn from these experiences, and it would be foolish to believe they could face their challenges alone. Jin Hyuk nodded in agreement, recognizing the need for a friend and ally, someone from their bloodline to stand by their side. Hendrik then made a surprising proposition, suggesting that Jin Hyuk should create a guild. Jin Hyuk, taken aback, stammered, A guild? Meanwhile, in the guildhouse on the 600th floor's holy kingdom, a woman expressed her frustration and inquired about the commotion. She opened the door and turned to Kane, asking him what was happening. Kane gazed at the flames that Jin Hyuk had ignited on the 10th floor and casually diverted her attention mentioning an intriguing report from the White Swallow branch on the tenth floor. He explained that the branch had been reduced to rubble by a single individual, leaving her in shock. Kane elaborated, noting that according to Beck Hallio's report, it didn't appear to be the work of an ordinary organization or guild. Her surprise deepened, and she asserted, impossible. She pointed out that even on a lower-level floor like the tenth, the penalty placed restrictions on one's strength, making it seemingly implausible for someone to accomplish such a feat. Ken snapped his fingers in agreement, adding that even nine starts like them found it impossible to conquer a guild house after receiving the ten-the-floor penalty. This indicated that the person responsible had already acquired immense power, much like them when they first entered the tower. The girl fell silent for a moment, and Kane suggested that it was still a possibility. She inquired about their course of action, if such an individual truly existed. With a sly grin, Kane proposed employing the same method they had used ten years ago, eliminating them all. Kane's plan involved hiring a skilled bounty hunter for the task. In another scene, a blonde girl was depicted defeating a massive snake, casually remarking that she had completed another task for the day. 
Creating these videos requires a significant investment of time and effort. Therefore, I would greatly appreciate your support by liking and subscribing to my channel. Your support means the world to me and motivates me to continue producing high-quality content. Your feedback and engagement are essential in shaping the direction of future videos. Thank you for being a part of this community.